Come on, 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 come on. Don't procrastinate, don't not take you late, girl. It's getting late, then it's and wait around. Come on, come on, turn a little faster. Come on, come on, the world will follow after. Come on, come on, everybody's after love. I do a really bad job at serenading people, don't I? Sorry. What's going on, guys? I'm Tyler, and I'm here to let you know that Come On, Come On is no perfect movie. And it centers on a radio journalist named Johnny, played by Joaquin Phoenix, who, after a family emergency, is forced to take his young nephew Jesse, played by Woody Norman, on a cross-country trip. And since the two of them have never had a consistent relationship before, it takes a while for them to really find common ground to get to know one another, and forge this wonderful father-son-like bond that we get over the course of this one journey. And I was excited to see this movie for a couple different reasons. I had seen this director's previous film, 20th Century Women, which I had a great time with. I loved how unique the presentation was in creating a fictional film that felt like it was a documentary. And when I had read the official synopsis and found out that Phoenix was going to be playing as close as he could to an average everyday man compared to most of his other roles, that every time a trailer played for this, I just looked down in my feed and hoped that I could go into this as blindly as possible, and I'm glad that I did, because even though I didn't fall in love with it as quickly as some others have, this is still one of the most heartfelt and genuinely realistic-feeling movies that I have seen all year. Director Mike Mills had this interesting choice of filming it in black and white with a 1.66 by 1 aspect ratio, kind of like what you're seeing right now. And at first I didn't think the black and white was going to be necessary other than maybe be a nod to Woody Allen's Manhattan because the majority of this does take place in New York and you get all those sweeping shots of skyscrapers and Manhattan life in between kind of as scene transitions from one conversation between Johnny and Jesse to another. But considering the themes of this movie tend to revolve around how we forget what it's like to become children when we're adults until we're faced with the responsibility of caring for one, leading us to pay more attention to what our kids say and do and cherish the memories that we forge with them because eventually when they grow up, they themselves are going to forget what it's like but we won't, so we'll be able to remind them what it's like, and they'll be able to cherish those memories even if they are a little blurry. The black and white cinematography does give the movie this nostalgic tone to it, and the editing style that's a little reminiscent of Terrence Malick in that there are lines of dialogue combined with montages that correlate to what the characters are talking about. It also, like 20th Century Women, feels as if we're watching a documentary or a home movie, especially when there are some conversations filmed from kind of a documentary perspective where characters are looking out of frame to somebody else who's off screen talking to them, and that conversation feels a little bit more like an interview. And in regards to the aspect ratio, this is going to sound a little weird, but for a while I couldn't figure out why he had chosen to use this one other than to make the smallest, most mon mundane moments in life feel large scale in scope and make, make us see the beauty in everyday life. And it definitely has that effect. The cinematography is gorgeous. It paints New York in a way that so few movies have ever done before. But then I started thinking about other movies that had similar formats to them, like Marriage Story or Midsommar that were filmed in two by one. And something that I realized that all three of these movies have in common is that they use the space of the frame to its advantage in cre creating an emotional effect. Every time they cut to a close-up, because they don't have to cut off part of an actor's face or head in the frame, it literally feels as if we're closer to these characters in their desperate time of need and giving this sense of intimacy. And in Come On, Come On especially, every time Johnny and Jesse are trying to express themselves to one another as honestly and emotionally as possible, Whenever they're in the exact same frame or they're closer together in the frame, you can definitely tell that they're starting to connect with one another even if the sound was off. Or if the camera was so far away from them, if the characters were so far away from each other in terms of blocking, 
or the conversation is being carried through in shot reverse shot coverage, that does let us know it's during the more dramatic moments where they feel estranged from one another. And the the distance between one character to another or the distance from the actors to the camera provides so much empty space that makes the characters feel lonely and isolated even when they're among company. It's even kind of backed up by this one visual metaphor of characters sitting in an empty room all by themselves and all they have for company is their own reflection through a mirror or a window to emphasize their loneliness. But make no mistake, the main reason to check out Come On, Come On, of course, is for the performances of Joaquin Phoenix and Woody Norman. These two gave two of the best performances, had some of the most legitimate chemistry in anything that I have seen all year. Phoenix, in my opinion, has never played an average guy so well before. I loved his understated expressions and downplayed line delivery that felt realistic without ever coming across as boring or phoned in. And what I loved about his character arc, if this were any other studio movie, the dynamic between the two of them would have been filled with so many contrived cliches of him being the most immature and incompetent caretaker to a child who is either too perfect or too plain even when they would have forged a significant and genuine bond, it would have been broken up by some stupid misunderstanding or liar revealed that would break them apart for the last 20 minutes. And as I'm describing it, you would already know by then where this movie would go. But thankfully, none of those cliches ever happen. And as opposed to a standard relationship in a movie that starts off at the very bottom, goes uphill, goes downhill in the last third, and then goes right back up, this relationship actually goes pretty rocky from scene one in a way where kids and parents can love each other in one moment and then the next second an argument breaks out where they suddenly hate each other, rinse and repeat each scene like an actual relationship. I love that Joaquin Phoenix right from the get-go is perfectly capable of caring for his own nephew. He puts on that exaggerated voice that family members make to the younger ones whenever they repeat something or are just playing with them. He can instantly snap from loving to angry whenever Jesse disobeys him. He knows exactly what to say and how loud of a tone. There are equally as many moments where he wants to play with him as much as he's genuinely frustrated by his eccentric routines. That's my best way of putting it. The question with this movie is not about whether he can be a good parent to this kid or not. It really comes down to whether or not he wants to be, whether or not he's willing to plow through the stress. And even during questions that Jesse has where he has no answers, he still tries to provide one in as clear of a way as possible about what kind of situation the family is going through. And even though he kind of talks down to him, it's in a way kind of like Sally Field and Forrest Gump or Kieran Hines in Belfast, where it genuinely feels like he's treating this kid as an adult, even though he has no solid or clear answers. I love the darkly comedic conversations that he has with his sister, Gabby Hoffman, who, if the name sounds familiar, she's not related to Dustin Hoffman, but she was actually the little sister in Uncle Buck, which was very interesting. I didn't actually recognize her as that. The conversations they have where he's venting out his frustrations to her and she has an, oh yeah, well here's this type of story, to let him know that that's part of the job, he's not alone in the stress. It's very cathartic for her because she doesn't have to deal with the situation, especially when she's got her own shit with her husband that she's trying to deal with. But she is also incredibly worried because her absence from her own son might damage the relationship more than it already has been. But as many people have pointed out, the standout and biggest surprise of the movie is Woody Norman as Jesse in his debut performance. Just like Jude Hill in Belfast, he never felt like he was phoning in a performance or fell flat. His expressions, line delivery, and body language were always on point from beginning to end. But what was so impressive about him more so than Jude Hill was that Norman finds a way for us to root for this kid even though he makes it extremely hard for us to root with him at times. And for everyone who's going to say, well, all kids were like that at one point, and to my relatives who were going, yeah, that was you and your sister at one point too. Trust me, I remember the meltdowns. You don't have to remind me of those. But here's the thing. 
Not every kid asks you to do this weird role-playing game where the kid is an orphan and you are someone else who has a dead child. I just want to point that out. That's one way this kid finds comfort in his situation. But at the same time, not every kid is watching one of their parents go through a mental health crisis that he can't process. But because of reasons that I'll get into later, he's still, even at the age of nine, incredibly concerned that he's going to grow up like his dad and have some serious emotional problems that'll fall back on the other family members to deal with. And... If you've ever remembered being babysat by an aunt or uncle or somebody else who had never had kids before, you probably remember how unfamiliar and seemingly unfair it was to be taking orders from someone who had a different parenting style than what you're used to. So it's he, he's quick to assume that Johnny's hesitation to go along with his daily routines or his mother's absence is a sign that he's completely all alone in processing all of these differing emotions but the moments where the two of them are lashing out at each other are inherently the moments that make them realize they made a significant mistake and are going to try harder to express themselves more clearly in the future so the two of them can finally find common ground in jesse's case one of those is by mimicking every single line of dialogue or every movement that johnny makes to kind of show him, hey, this is how you're speaking to me. This is exactly how it sounds. Just want to let you know before it rubs off me the wrong way. And it was so funny. It was so charming. It um, reminded me a lot of how I spoke to my family members as a kid. But it also goes to show when kids grow older, they tend to build their own personality traits by mimicking the actions of their elders, whether it be for better or worse, whether it be from the people they love or hate the most. And because of that realization, even at their most stressful points, Johnny and his sister do everything they can to set a good example for this kid. As much as I have high praises for this movie, you can really feel its pacing as it goes by. When the movie was over, I thought it had been two and a half hours long, and I would have had no problem if that were the case, because the, the interactions were so equally charming and hilarious, but still heartfelt, bittersweet, and dramatic. Movie was only an hour 40, hour 50, and it felt a hell of a lot longer. And I think it's because even though I was never bored by it for a second, there are some scenes that, in terms of the content and the message, felt pretty repetitive, and I felt like you could have cut some of those scenes out to give more time to Scoot McNary as the father, because without spoiling anything... He's more of a flashback character who only exists in the montages, and you only get a, t a tiny glimpse of what he was like as a character. There's only one or two scenes where he's actually in the same room as Jesse, which I thought was kind of weird. The last third especially has so many moments where, as Johnny and Jesse are embracing each other, you think that there's going to be that final monologue that has that insight, and then it'll cut to black. But then it just kept going, and it got so annoying with how much they... I don't want to say they were teasing us, at least not on purpose, but that was what it felt like. And as a minor nitpick, we do get montages of Johnny on the job going from one city to another, interviewing random children about what they think the future holds for them and what needs to change in order for things to get better. And you can tell that these kids are not professional actors and are genuinely improvising what they feel from the heart and that part definitely felt nice when they offer some insightful advice but they were distracting for one particular reason sometimes they could get a little too political when this is not a political movie this could take place in any area of the world follow any demographic of people and the story the characters and arc wouldn't have changed it would have been resonant for any audience member and those are the kinds of stories that I appreciate the most, stories that we really don't get that often anymore. For reasons I don't want to get into, because someone's going to call me an asshole for it, but... In any case, Come On, Come On was such a great experience. It had two of the best performances I've seen all year, some of the best cinematography, and some of the most well-fleshed-out, grounded messages about how kids and adults can equally learn messages from one another. And if you like, if you know anything about my personal tastes, you know that I love stories like that. Joaquin Phoenix and Woody Norman alone should get Oscar buzz for this. I'm kind of surprised that they're not, because their chemistry was so 
legit that I was constantly smiling no matter how funny or sad a moment can get. And by the end, even though I wasn't crying like I hoped I would, I did get teary-eyed and choked up on a couple of different occasions, even when the material can drag or get repetitive after a while. So for all those reasons, I wasn't going to rate it this high, but now I legitimately feel it. I'm going to give Come On, Come On a 4.5 out of 5. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. Guys, thanks as always for watching. If you have seen Come On, Come On, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. Be sure to stay tuned for more reviews, and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.